What up, what up? Good morning, good morning. It is your boy Jay Goble back at it again. Not many noble. Reading the Bible through in 22 in a chronological order. According to a reading list. I know I keep keep saying that. Keep going back and forth. Keep telling you. Then we don't know exactly where some of the some of it fits in, but for the majority, I really like reading the Old Testament in, <laughs> in chronological order. Even though, yeah, maybe, maybe Job, where, where does it fit in? I don't know. But we read, we read Genesis, we read Job, then we read Exodus. We sprinkled some first Chronicles in there where we thought it went. When I say we, I mean the people who put together the chronological reading list, not me. I'm not that smart. And now we're into Leviticus and it's all been about offerings and it's been a little bit difficult uh, to get through without being bored out of your skull because, well, we don't really speak much in this type of language anymore. We don't make uh, s- offerings and sacrifices like this, quite like this anymore. We don't live in a world that does this, the majority of us, in Western society and Western culture. So it's a little challenging to wrap our heads around sometimes, but I want to just encourage you to keep these overarching themes in mind that we picked up in Genesis in the beginning, the fall into sin and that the wages of sin are death. Sin must be dealt with and it requires bloodshed. Secondly, there's the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent. And there is a promise of God, this promise of redemption to atone for sin, to bring back at one mint, uh, to, to make man and God bring them back to one, bring them back together in harmonious existence through the seed of the woman. That is a promise made by God in Genesis after the fall. We are seeing that play out. We're seeing it play out in this world on this canvas of chaos, order, sin, obedience, disobedience and obedience, the righteous, the wicked, this moral landscape. But we're trying to figure out, you know, how is one made righteous? How do you get into a right standing with God again? How do we get back to God? That's been the question that we've been trying to answer. We see different people groups trying to answer it. We see different people trying to answer it. And the way that God is answering it is not the way that we would. We already talked about Moses. Probably wouldn't have picked that dude. Would not have been like, that's my guy. I want you to lead us up on out of here. You're going to do it. Probably not. Probably not. And then the way that sin is dealt with, disobedience is dealt with, we probably wouldn't have done it. We wouldn't pick this way. We would not pick the way that God picks. We wouldn't do it. When we look at the type of behavior that God requires, we certainly wouldn't pick that. And we took a look at some of the ancient world and their customs and the way things went and child sacrifices, um, weird, strange sexual behavior, desires being satisfied in order to, you know, uh, appeal to gods of fertility and have a good life in the future and blessings upon the crops and births, all kinds of stuff. And they went about it in a way that, I don't know, it's, it, it appeals, certainly appeals to the flesh, you know, drug, sex, and rock and roll. <laughs> but the way that God is prescribing for the Israelites is not the way they would have chosen. We can tell because they, they don't do a good job sticking to it. They don't. They don't stick to it, just like we don't stick to it. And we looked at the moral law of God in the 10 commandments encapsulated in the 10 commandments saw their connection with creation and that they have been there from the beginning and that 
there's a difference between the moral law of God and the rest of the Mosaic covenant in its application for us as Christians, Gentiles, the majority of us, looking back through Christ who satisfied, fulfilled, was the reason that these things took place. A lot of these, a lot of, a lot of what Israel did, it was pictures of the seed of the woman to come, the great sacrifice, the Passover lamb, the lamb of God, the way that God was going to redeem people unto himself. That's what we're seeing. Keep that in mind as we read and as you're like, this don't make no sense to me. I feel you. I feel you with that. But I think it does make sense as long as we keep that framework in mind. That's how we understand the Bible, this this framework. So, okay. Leviticus, we're reading chapters 7 and 8 today. Chapter 7. This is the law of the trespass offering. It is most holy. In the place where they kill the burnt offering, he shall kill the trespass offering, and its blood he shall sprinkle around on the altar. He shall offer of all its fat, the fat tail, and the fat that covers the innards, and he shall take away the two kidneys and the fat that is on them, which is by the loins and the cover on the liver with the kidneys. And the priest shall burn them on the altar for an offering made by fire to Yahweh. It is a trespass offering. Every male among the priests may eat of it. It shall be eaten in a holy place. It is most holy. As is the sin offering, so is the trespass offering. There is one law for them. The priest who makes atonement with them shall have it. The priest who offers any man's burnt offering shall have for himself the skin of the burnt offering which he has offered. Every meal offering that is baked in the oven and all that is prepared in the pan and on the griddle shall be the priest's who offers it. Every meal more offering, morning, every meal offering mixed with oil or dry belongs to all the sons of Aaron, one as well as another. This is the law of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which one shall offer to Yahweh. If he offers it for a thanksgiving, then he shall offer with the sacrifice of thanksgiving unleavened cakes mixed with oil and unleavened wafers anointed with oil and cakes mixed with oil. He shall offer his offering with the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving with cakes of leavened bread. Of it, he shall offer one out of each offering for a heave offering to Yahweh. It shall be the priests who sprinkles the blood of the peace offerings. The flesh of the sacrifice of his peace offerings for thanksgiving shall be eaten on the day of his offering. He shall not leave any of it until the morning. But if the sacrifice of his offering is a vow or a freewill offering, it shall be eaten on the day that he offers his sacrifice. On the next day, what remains of it shall be eaten, but what remains of the meat of the sacrifice on the third day shall be burned with fire. If any of the meat of the sacrifice of his peace offerings is eaten on the third day, it will not be accepted, and it shall not be credited to him who offers it. It will be an abomination, and the soul who eats any of it will bear his iniquity. This third day, keep coming across it, right? The third day, like Abraham, wilderness, the third day for Isaac, uh, when when he was told by God to sacrifice him, and then they found a ram in the thicket. So we see a lot of this, this third day, third day, third day. And then we see Christ uh, resurrected the third day. So it's just, we see these pictures, these pictures of things to come, things to come, things to come. The meat that touches any unclean thing shall not be eaten. Verse 19 continues. It shall be burned with fire. As for the meat, everyone who is clean may eat it. But the soul who eats of the meat of the sacrifice of peace offerings that belongs to Yahweh, having his uncleanness on him, that soul shall be cut off from his people. When anyone touches any unclean thing, the uncleanness of man or an unclean animal or any unclean abomination and eats some of the meat of the sacrifice of peace offerings, which belong to Yahweh, that soul shall be cut off from his people. Yahweh spoke to Moses saying, speak to the children of Israel saying, you shall eat no fat of bull or sheep or goat, the fat of that which dies of itself and the fat of that which is torn of animals may be used for any other service, but you shall in no way eat of it. For whoever eats the fat of the animal, which men offer as an offering made by fire to Yahweh, even the soul who eats it shall be cut off from his people. You shall not eat any blood, whether it is of bird or of animal, in any of your dwellings. Whoever it is who eats any blood, 
that soul shall be cut off from his people. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to the children of Israel, saying, He who offers the sacrifice of his peace offerings to Yahweh shall bring his offering to Yahweh out of the sacrifice of his peace offerings. With his own hands he shall bring the offerings of Yahweh made by fire. He shall bring the fat with the breast, with the, that the breast may be waved for a wave offering before Yahweh. The priest shall burn the fat on the altar, but the breast shall be Aaron's and his son's. The right thigh you shall give to the priest for a heave offering out of the sacrifices of your peace offerings. He among the sons of Aaron who offers the blood of the peace offerings and the fat shall have the right thigh for a portion. For the waved breast and the heaved thigh I have taken from the children of Israel out of the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them to Aaron the priest and to his sons as their portion forever from the children of Israel. This is the consecrated portion of Aaron and the consecrated portion of his sons out of the offerings of Yahweh made by fire in the day when he presented them to minister to Yahweh in the priest's office, which Yahweh commanded to be given them of the children of Israel in the day that he anointed them. It is their portion forever throughout their generations. This is the law of the burnt offering, the meal offering, the sin offering, the trespass offering, the consecration, and the sacrifice of peace offerings, which Yahweh commanded Moses in Mount Sinai in the day that he commanded the children of Israel to offer their offerings to Yahweh in the wilderness of Sinai. And of course, we are in the World English Bible, the Web Bible. It is a no copyright, royalty free version. That's why we use it. Leviticus chapter 8. Yahweh spoke to Moses, saying, Take Aaron and his sons with him, and the garments, and the anointing oil, and the bull of the sin offering, and the two rams, and the basket of unleavened bread, and assemble all the congregation at the door of the tent of meeting. Moses did as Yahweh commanded him, and the congregation was assembled at the door of the tent of meeting. Moses said to the congregation, This is the thing which Yahweh has commanded to be done. Moses brought Aaron and his sons and washed them with water. He put the tunic on him, tied the sash on him, clothed him with the robe, put the ephod on him, and he tied the skillfully woven band of the ephod on him and fastened it to him with it. He placed the placed the breastplate on him. He put the urim and the thummim in the breastplate. He set the turban on his head. He set the golden plate, the holy crown, on the front of the turban as Yahweh commanded Moses. Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle and all that was in it and sanctified them. He sprinkled it on the altar seven times and anointed the altar and all its vessels and the basin and its base to sanctify them. He poured some of the anointing oil on Aaron's beard and anointed him to sanctify him. Moses brought Aaron's sons and clothed them with tunics and tied sashes on them and put headbands on them, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He brought the bull of the sin offering, and Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the bull of the sin offering. He killed it, and Moses took the blood and put it around on the horns of the altar with his finger and purified the altar and poured out the blood at the base of the altar and sanctified it to make atonement for it. He took all the fat that was on the innards and the cover of the liver and the two kidneys and their fat, and Moses burned it on the altar. But the bowl and its skin and its meat and its dung he burned with fire outside the camp, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He presented the ram of the burnt offering. Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He killed it, and Moses sprinkled the blood around the, on the altar. He cut the ram into its pieces, and Moses burned the head and the pieces and the fat. He washed the innards and the legs with water, and Moses burned the whole ram on the altar. It was a burnt offering for a pleasant aroma. It was an offering made by fire to Yahweh, as Yahweh commanded Moses. He presented the other ram, the ram of consecration. Aaron and his sons laid their hands on the head of the ram. He killed it, and Moses took some of its blood and put it on the tip of Aaron's right ear and on the thumb of his right hand and on the great toe of his right foot. He brought Aaron's sons, and Moses put some of the blood on the tip of their right ear and on the thumb of their right hand, and on the great toe of their right foot, and Moses sprinkled the blood around on the altar. He took the fat, the fat tail, and uh, all the fat that was on the innards, the cover of the liver, the two kidneys and their fat, and the right thigh. And out of the basket of unleavened bread that was before Yahweh, he took one unleavened cake, one cake of oiled bread, and one wafer, and placed them on the fat and on the right thigh. He put all these in Aaron's hands and in his son's hands and waved them for a wave offering before Yahweh. Moses took them from their hands and burned them on the altar on the burnt offering. They were a consecration offering for a pleasant aroma. 
it was an offering made by fire to Yahweh. Moses took the breast and waved it for a wave offering before Yahweh. It was Moses' portion of the ram of consecration, as Yahweh commanded Moses. Moses took some of the anointing oil and some of the blood which was on the altar and sprinkled it on Aaron, on his garments, and on his sons, and on his sons' garments with him, and sanctified Aaron, his garments, and his sons, and his sons' garments with him. Moses said to Aaron and to his sons, Boil the meat at the door of the tent of meeting, and there eat it. And the bread that is in the basket of consecration, as I commanded, saying, Aaron and his sons shall eat it. What remains of the meat of the bread you shall burn with fire. You shall not go out from the door of the tent of meeting for seven days until the days of your consecration are fulfilled, for he shall consecrate you seven days. What has been done today, so Yahweh commanded, has commanded to do, to make atonement for you. You shall stay at the door of the tent of meeting day, uh, sorry, you shall stay at the door of the tent of meeting day and night, seven days, and keep Yahweh's command that you don't die. For so I am commanded. Aaron and his sons did all the things which Yahweh commanded by Moses. So a couple things to take away just real quick. It's a little quick one. You know, we're we're under 20 minutes here, and I think a lot of them are, are kind of under 20 minutes at this time. But it is interesting to me, like Moses is doing all these things for Aaron, you know, like Aaron's doing all this work. He's the, the, the high priest, the leader of the, of the priesthood here. Right. And Moses is told by God to do all these things for him. And it, it doesn't, I don't know. It doesn't really look like what you would expect if some dude was making something up and he wanted a number two. The number two would typically, hey, I want you do all these things to me. I'm going to wear the headdress. I'm going to wear the breastplate. I'm going to have these things on me. I'm going to get sanctified and sprinkled with blood here. You guys are going to do that for me because I'm the man. Y'all need to follow me. I'm the man. I'm the head dog. I'm the one in charge. But it's not like that. It's opposite that. Moses is just obedient. And Aaron is the one who is, I don't know, not exalted. Maybe that's not the right word, but he's the one that's that's leading this and doing these things. Now I know Moses is the one consecrating and he's, he's killing and he's sprinkling the blood and he's doing all that, but that's more like he's doing the work. He's doing the work. It's not having the work done to him. So I don't know. It's just something that stands out to me a little bit as more, I don't know. It just seems to make sense. Like the Bible makes sense makes a lot of sense. That's what, that's what you, you would expect it to be not like us. You would expect things to be not what we would do. And that's what you see over and over because God is not like us. He is a being completely unlike us, his creation. When we try to think of him in ways that we understand or that we can predict or that makes sense to us, it's, it's no, we're normally on the wrong track. We're normally on the wrong track. He's a being that is completely self-sustaining and not anything like us. So anyhow, I thought that was, I thought that was interesting that that came to mind. And some of the, the other things are just, I don't know. It just seems very, very foreign to me. Just to be honest, which is I'm reading it just seems very foreign. And the, this reminder that sin equals death is very foreign to our modern sensibilities and you don't, we don't put our hands on things and kill them. We're so far removed from blood, bloodshed. I go to the grocery store. (laughs) Everything's been, been killed and everything's sterile packaged ready for me. So anyhow, thank you so much for listening in today. Thank you for spending time with me every day. Thank you for your support and Oh, this was, what was this, February 18th? So that's 30, 49 days. 49 days we've been going at it together. So thank you. And show notes, notmanynoble.com. I will catch y'all tomorrow.